your intuition, let's say, you know, deep inside yourself, something maybe something you can't prove, but why, why do you think this is all how it's laid out? Why do you think we're here? Basically, the universe is moving towards this. It's the system moving towards an attractor. The wave function collapse isn't random. If you have an isolated quantum system, it's going to look random. But when everything's interacting, everything, all of those wave functions must be collapsed. If the universe is becoming more complex, that puts constraints on how the wave function collapses such that the collapses must in totality add up towards going towards this omega point. There is a multiverse, but it's not like every possibility exists. There was this evolutionary process where in, in Lee Smolin's model of cosmological natural selection, when you have a universe form and then a black hole forms in that universe, since a, a big bang is like a singularity event that creates a universe, the idea is that when a, bit, a black hole forms in the universe, that's a big bang event that creates a new universe. And that's so you have these Evolu this evolutionary process that's creating more and more universes and the universes that are good at creating black holes and black holes come from stars and stars create the chemistry that's needed for life then you'll get more and more universes that create more and more black holes so more and more universes that have more and more stars and so then this process will lead to more and more universes that are firmly for life because stars create the higher elements that are needed for life and then so if this evolutionary process is true you'll have this selection pressure towards getting more life-friendly universes. My ultimate understanding was that nature has this life-generating principle. It's really hard to determine, you know, we still have that why something from nothing problem, but we are making progress. It's not introducing unnecessary stuff by going outside this universe because we have the fine-tuning mystery that is begging for a solution that we don't have unless we think about these other things. Creator, cosmological selection, and the multiverse theory, which I don't think is a good explanation because it introduces everything just to explain away a creator when we shouldn't necessarily need to explain a creator with every possible universe exists. It's just, I don't think it's the right, I don't think it's superior epistemologically, Occam's razor, all those things we mentioned. So ultimately I'm left with the process itself being God and that we could be created by an agent, but it wouldn't be this all powerful fundamental thing that was there forever it would be a product of this process, but that process seems to be eternal. So even if we have a God, a creator, I don't think if I learned about him, I don't think I'd pray to him. I, I think if we have a creator, it might be like us creating things. And then we want to ask our AI, like, is there a God? Like maybe if we do have a creator, they're looking for us to answer. So maybe we're the AI that's going to inform them. But so even if we had a creator, I'm not necessarily sure that I don't think that would be the end of all answers. I think it's more spiritually satisfying to be like, to just recognize there is a process that leads to life, leads to consciousness and unending consciousness, reaching higher and higher levels of experience. So it's a journey for me, but what I am convinced by is that there, you do have this trajectory. And once you start asking what that, why it's this way, you get into all the explanations that I've just said. And I think they're better than the nihilistic multiverse. We're just weak anthropic principle version. Bobby Azarian is a cognitive neuroscientist, journalist, and author of The Romance of Reality, how the universe organizes itself to create life, consciousness, and cosmic complexity. If you got this far, please hit that subscribe button. And I hope you enjoy our conversation. Bobby, thank you for coming on. Hey, Carlos. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's such a pleasure. I'm so excited to speak with you. Uh, we're going to talk about your book, The Romance of Reality. And what, for this kicked off, um, before I outline the three parts that we're going to cover um, in today's discussion, I want to start off with something that I usually, I usually start, have this as the last question for guests on the, on the podcast. Um, and I'm not going to ask you this question directly. It's more something I was just thinking about. But I usually ask people, if you could go back and give your 18-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? And I'm thinking about it in terms of this book, because if I could go back and give myself one book, say like the summer before college, it would be this book. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Honestly. I mean, I mean that wholeheartedly because it's fantastic. It ex I really, I, I had no knowledge of complexity science up until a few years ago. And this book is just an excellent synthesis of so many big ideas. And I give it my highest recommendation, people watching this right now, um, I hope you listen to the whole conversation, but there'll be a link below in the description for you to go out and buy this book because it's incredible. Thank you so much. I, I put a lot of time and thought into it. And 
it's so nice to hear things like that because, um, yeah, the intention was to kind of give a big picture view of complexity science, which includes all these other sciences, but like what that, what those sciences are showing us as far as like the big picture questions, which a lot of the complexity books don't really get into. They kind of mm -hmm. hint at things, but this was just kind of pulling all, putting all the existential things out there. Um, but to hear that, yeah, that, that, that really makes me feel like the work is worth it and motivates me for the, the follow-up book that mm. I'm starting. And uh, so thank you for that. That's awesome. I, I really appreciate that. And, and it, that's great to know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean it. I mean, and even a few months ago, a commenter on one of my videos asked me for my, my top 10 list. And so I have to revise that because I have to knock somebody off and put this book in. <laughs> sorry so, to the person Nass who gets knocked yeah, off. But, Nassim yeah. Nicholas Taleb, I'm sorry. <laughs> knock that guy off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, his book, I really like his book, Anti-Fragile. I thought it was fantastic. I but, haven't read yeah. it. He's a brilliant yeah. guy, but I've yeah. seen some of his tweets where I was like, huh, I don't know. Uh, he's a um, troll. He's a professional yeah, troll. He, yeah, he's kind of, but maybe that's cool. Yeah. Maybe, uh, you know, he yeah. mixes it up. I don't know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I don't know him personally. But so I just want to let the audience know that. Um, also, as we, for the audience to know, I'll have links in the description for uh, for all of your stuff for your, um, your blog, Road to Omega, your Psychology Today articles, um, and of course the, the link to buy the book as well. So and I want folks to know, uh, sort of this is gonna be in three parts. I uh, hope we have time to allocate across all three, but the first one we're gonna, I think about in terms of uh, crawl, walk, teleport. So <laughs> <That's great. laughs> we're gonna crawl, we're gonna start, ground ourselves in the science, um, the major ideas behind the book. We don't have time to dive into every last detail because there's so much in here. It's very densely packed. We're going to start there, part two, uh, where I want to spend a lot of time on. And I know this is something that you're focusing a lot of time on right now, your current projects, is how people can use this in their daily lives, how they can integrate it um, you know, into their habits, their routines. So I want, to, I want to spend a lot of time there. And then at the end, if we have time, we'll push the boundaries a little bit, talk about the more speculative stuff, allow ourselves to uh, talk about things like um you know universal darwinism baby universes spawn from black holes things that are a little bit more out there yeah uh, time permitting so let's get into it let's stay let's you know crawl before we walk and if you wouldn't mind can you lay the groundwork for the audience can you set the table and provide us with really high level description of of the book and some of the, the core ideas yeah um i realized i didn't answer your question about if i could go back in time to being 18 so i don't know if i should address that later or we should go into it was Let's it if it i now. so if it's, it, on, if it's on your mind yeah yeah and the structure is great because walk crawl teleport matches the structure of the book which is organized into three parts origins mm -hmm. about the origin of life evolution and transcendence um so yeah there'll be a logical flow and i will not go into much detail about the evolutionary mechanisms in part one mm -hmm. that's mostly what the book is about um but i've talked about that in a lot of detail in other interviews and want to just give a good big picture overview of all the stuff that you just mentioned so if anyone's interested in more details you can go to my Substack road to omega um my book is available on amazon and other retailers and uh yeah those and other talks online but um this will be less detailed and more philosophical uh i guess you know bigger picture focused on that um if i was 18 so it was was it what book would i read at 18 or what would i tell myself at 18. so that's funny i i, I answered what book because i was thinking so much about your book but yeah either one yeah so both. but but the yeah. first part the original question was if I could go back in time and kind of give myself advice. Yeah. Yeah. That's the original question. Sure. That's what you ask everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got to watch all those. I, I love the Don, yeah. Donald Hoffman interview. I haven't oh, uh, gotten to watch the other ones, but I know yeah, you yeah. read Brennan Graham Dempsey and Greg who are friends and I saw mm -hmm. Michael Levin and some really cool people. So I got to go mm -hmm. see their answers to that. Cause that's a good question. Um, so I don't know if this is how it, I would normally answer, but this has been on my mind. So it's like when you understand the paradigm presented in the book, which is not necessarily, not really my paradigm. I've approached this like a scientist who definitely, I guess, had an, a hypothesis, but also as a journalist. Mm. Um, so as a person who's a scientist and who believes in the importance of evidence for your beliefs and your arguments, um, 
you know, I, I, I couldn't see myself just having some hypothesis that was never out there and like really like putting it forward. Like the reason that I feel confident about the argument in the book is because it's based on so many people who have seen the same cosmic narrative, you could call it this new story of nature. And, um, it's really interesting because, uh, you know, you could bring up some of these ideas to some people and especially like 15 or 20 years ago. And some people are like, no, that sounds like new age stuff or no, that can't be mm. right. The universe is waking up or becoming conscious or something like that, or you know, it's growing more and more complex always without limit. And they're like, no, that's not scientific. That violates this law and this, or, or this idea, or that was shown to be like, it's amazing that that was the stance toward this narrative, which we'll get into. And, uh, it, it, it was just totally ideological. And there've been other people that have been saying this other thing. And somehow for cultural reasons, people, most people got convinced that certain things that people could say about the universe were just completely wrong and pseudoscientific. And we're seeing that's completely not true. And it's been exciting because I've written certain articles like challenging the heat death hypothesis and that life has to come to an end in the universe. For example, I just wrote one for Noema. Um, the physicist David Deutsch shared it. Uh, Sabina Hassenfelder and Richard Hansen, big names were like commenting. Like she mm. said she had written something similar in a chapter in her book. I haven't read it yet. Mm. And Robin Hansen was like, yeah, maybe life can go. It depends on if entropy has an, uh, an upper bound. But my point is with all of the articles that I've published, I thought we're saying something super radical. The one that kind of planted the seed for the book was called Is the Universe Pro-Life for Courts? And Sean Carroll gave me a quote for that and, and retweeted that and said, you know, mm. controversial topic, opinions may differ, but, you know, he thought that was a good potential argument that life was inevitable based on thermodynamic mm. um, 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 like arguments. And um, I think he'd probably even say that was the case now. So there were things where I thought that it was going to be a real challenge um, to say this stuff um, uh, because of just consensus and all of that's changing. And it's the most exciting time ever. So one thing I would tell myself if I went back is like, um, but I kind of followed this advice anyway. It's not what I was going to say originally, <laughs> but I was going to say, don't, 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 if, if you, again, it wasn't based off anything. I was, you know, looking around me, reading tons of stuff, um, uh, you know, gave me a strong feeling that, you know, the universe is becoming more complex. It's not becoming increasingly disordered. And I need to look into this. So if, as, as long as you feel like you're basing your something, basing your belief on like evidence and you have a strong argument, do not pay attention to like current consensus. Don't be afraid if like someone's like, oh, you're a crackpot because of this. Just put the time into articulating your idea. Mm. Um, because if you articulate it, well, it's really interesting. Like there's, there's things in the book where if I were to, if the chapters were only a paragraph long and people were re reading little summaries, they might not be convinced at all. They're like, this goes against everything we know, but then you read the book and you see the arguments and it's the art, it's specifically the technical arguments that just but through that skepticism, for example, Michael Shermer, I didn't know what he was going to think of the book. Right. And uh, he ended up giving a blurb that actually yeah, no. on the cover, yeah. talking about like yeah. people having a purpose to your mm -hmm. purpose is to discover your own purpose. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so that was thrilling um, to, to it's, it's and it's still happening to see these kind of ideological, you know, ideas that have we're kind of cemented as like, this is the truth, um, are starting to be dismantled because they were never on a firm basis. And, um, uh, yeah. So basically stick to your beliefs. Like, I mean, yeah, don't get deterred from, from, from something. If you, if you, if you feel that is right, um, quickly, because we need to get into all the other stuff, but this is kind of already getting into those topics, but I will say that the ideas in the book made me look at life in a different way as far as like life does have this intrinsic goal, which is to stay in existence. And that gives us an intrinsic purpose. 
And um, once you see things in that way, you can kind of start to interpret life as being a game where there's challenges and goals. And then you start to think of your moment, your life on a moment to moment basis as sort of being this thing where you're like accumulating points. I um, mean, you don't want to get carried away with this, but overall, yeah. I think it's a good way to optimize life where you're just re really thinking like, okay, I'm not wasting time today because I've had this game kind of framework where I have these goals and I'm not doing things right now to get to my goals. That doesn't mean you don't relax. You don't have fun because that's part of getting to your goals. But if I could go back to when I was 18 or even before high school, like starting high school, I would have imagined my life as being a, a, a type of game. So I wouldn't miss opportunities and I would, you know, take advantage of things where I, I just miss certain opportunities of life because I didn't have this mindset that I have now. Um, yeah, yeah. So Ooh. I, I do think this, this game lens that we'll get into is really helpful for sort of like optimizing your life. And, and mm -hmm. once you realize it, then you're like, Oh man, I kind of wasted time being suboptimal. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. In life. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Now we'll, we'll spend a lot of time and I'll make sure like that our, our fattest section is the, the game of life. Um, it's road to Omega that we're, that we're on before we get into that a little bit, just to, um, help an audience. And I think you well, you just alluded to it a little bit. This, I think that your book is a response to the failure of reductionism in science. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about, I guess, that changing paradigm and then also sprinkle in, you know, your, your unified theory of reality, uh, which you have a great flow chart from infinity maps that I'm sure I'll, I'll overlay at some point um, in this discussion. But I know there's a lot, there's a lot there because there's, uh, you know, a few different frameworks that you bring in, but I love to just get, if you could provide us with a, a little bit of an overview, that'd be super helpful. Yeah. Let me, there's so many things I've been talking about and writing about, like there could be a conversation, you know, full mm -hmm. podcast on each of these topics. So I'm know. just trying to be mindful to like, say, you know, be brief and say the most important things mm -hmm. because there's so many cultural factors that like you can trace this back to like this question to like understanding the different eras, uh, basically like pre-modernism, modernism, post-modernism, modernism, post and whatever we're getting into now. But like pre-modernism was kind of the time before science where like religion ruled and people believed supernatural beliefs. And there was this strict hierarchy and uh, modernism was basically a response to that. And it happened, you know, it's kind of started with the Enlightenment period in like the 17th century, 18th century um, and the scientific, you know, kind of the birth of the scientific method. Um, and when I started writing the book, I thought that's kind of when it was like the onset of reductionism and atheism and kind of this idea that the universe was meaningless and purposeless. Mm -hmm. But I found out that that's not true at all. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, there was this modern movement that was like very pro-science and pro-reason and logic. Um, but it wasn't what we have now, or it wasn't what the, the kind of scientific ideology of the 20th century, which was more nihilistic, you know, nothing has any meaning, there's no purpose, there's no design. Um, and uh, basically, oh, and there's no such thing as like, continued complexification, because that kind of implies progress. Um, and so basically modernism started off like it was still pretty religious and i'm not advocating for organized religion by any means but what i'm saying is it, there's a different mindset newton was extremely religious a lot of the um greatest physicists of our time the, a lot of the founders of thermodynamics james clerk maxwell lord Kel kelvin they were all very religious and we're driven by this idea that reality is mysterious and they're basically trying to understand what they described as the mind of God. And you see that language retained in like Stephen right. Hawking and stuff. And you'll yeah. find videos of like Richard Dawkins saying, you know, you can make a good argument for a God if you basically are mm -hmm. a creator, if you put them behind, you know, at the very, you yeah. know, that they design the system and then let it evolve to its own dynamics. And sure. he says, the God of Paul Davies, the God of the physicist, 
And I was like the God of the physicists. And it was like interesting. I was like looking more into the different physicists and, you know, a lot of people know Newton is Christian. Some people know like Godel, who's a mathematician was very Christian. Um, but like, I didn't know like the founders, a lot of, you know, the founders of the second law of thermodynamics were Christian as well. And actually the heat death theory, I believe had Christian motivations because basically Lord, yeah, it's super fascinating, but Lord Kelvin who kind of popularized the second law of thermodynamics, which, you know, he and Clausius kind of independently uh, put forth. And just for anyone who doesn't know, the second law of thermodynamics is the law that entropy always must increase in the universe. Uh, well, in systems. See, that's the thing. It was supposed to be applied just to like closed systems. And right. then people immediately started to try to apply it to the whole universe. But a lot of the um, impetus for doing that was like Lord Kelvin knew that if the universe had to end, it kind of had to imply there was a beginning and that the end of the universe, the heat death kind of paralleled sort of judgment, you know, day of judgment type stuff. Oh, wow. So interesting dissertation online, which talks about the religious motivations hmm. underlying the second law of thermodynamics, Sir Arthur Eddington, who made the quote, the second law of thermodynamics is, you know, if you have a theory that goes up against that, right. I can only, you know, whatever, you know, You're but wrong, it was yeah. like, yeah. And um, he was very Christian as well and referred to himself as a rational mystic, which I thought was a nice, you know, kind of paradoxical mm. term that kind of I, I, I felt like a relation to because reality is very mysterious. And um, I'm not saying we can't understand. It. I'm actually saying we can, but we haven't yet. There's lots of mm -hmm. secrets to uncover. We'll never understand it completely, but that's what this complexification process, the world's getting more complex that happens when organisms start modeling the world and when they start modeling the world to survive in it they start getting a larger and more detailed map of the world and that allows them to manipulate the world around them which allows life to spread um so you have this this story that um uh is basically yeah it, it, it's really different than what we've been taught in science so yeah my point was in modernism um, scientists still were, you know, driven by this kind of mystical, you know, desire to understand, uh, nature, the mystery of nature. And uh, really the, the whole idea was that, pro you know, we could use science to achieve unlimited progress. Um, but this became associated with like capitalism and colonialism and stuff like that. Sure. So then yeah, yeah, postmodernism yeah. was just kind of this school of thought that emerged that was a critique of modernism. So it was a critique mm -hmm. of like science thinking you could find objective truth that like there's really subjectivity. That's really important. There's maybe no objective truth and that what every cultural culture believes is relative in a social construct. So there's cultural relativism, which says like no culture is really objectively better than others, which suggests that science is really not any not in any way more fundamentally so more solid than any religions or, you know, kind of folk mythologies. Mm -hmm. And so it was uh, idea. Postmodernism was good because there were a lot of things to critique about modernism, but it should have been a critique that improved, you know, how we think about these things and, you know, the, the limits of science or, you know, how certain we should be about things. But like, I think it was really bad that it basically tried to eliminate this idea that there is this, you know, progress towards, you know, higher intelligence in the biosphere, because I think it's a law that you can't, it's something that you see a principle of nature that is real. And if we don't understand that, we have no idea how our civilization is evolving and where we're going, because it's not driven by some mystical force. It's not something where progress is like, just keeps happening like perfectly. It's this error correction process that's similar to AI. Life is facing challenges. It's like life is similar to an AI being trained on data. And the data is the, the, the chaotic world around us. And so we keep being faced with problems and we keep having to overcome those problems. And a lot of organisms die out during that. But the ones that can solve those problems get to uh, make copies of themselves. And so we get all of these designs of organisms and AIs and everything. Basically, there's a natural selection applies not just to living organisms, but all designs in life. And basically the dysfunctional and inefficient designs get filtered out. So we have these 
designs that get more and more robust. And that leads to this process of basically life spreading inevitably, but it's not the straight line. It's always, you know, there's always like two steps back for one step forward, but you can see the trend clearly. And people like Ray Kurzweil have mapped out these trends of technological increase, but showing the technological increase as continuous with the complexity increase of life, because life is really information processing. And um, so life is fundamentally different than inanimate matter. But AI, I wouldn't say, is that fundamentally different from life? I mean, it's not, AR AI is not alive, but it's an extension of life. It's, mm. it's got designs that would never appear in nature unless life first emerged. Mm. So you had pre-modernism, which was supernatural. Then you had the modern movement, which was like science, but that science could solve everything. And then maybe some people took that idea too far and thought, you know, let's do eugenics. And the Nazis exploited that theory of increasing complexification and opened it to evolution to justify like superior and inferior races. So there are all these cultural issues that led people to, to, to not like certain ideas, whether it was the Nazis using this idea of like evolutionary progress or Teilhard de Chardin was a, 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 a priest, a Catholic priest that wrote this book that the, the church actually hated because they thought it was like against in Christian teaching, but it was that evolution, you know, everything is becoming more complex and that maybe God is in the future. Maybe there seems to be some sort of design, but that everything for example, the, 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 the network of humans is, is um, approaching some sort of global mind that will emerge and this process will continue. So Teilhard de Chardin wrote this book called The Phenomenon of Man that put out this omega point theory that the, my book is you know, largely based on and all yeah. the scientists who have been writing about this stuff, complexity scientists, people at the Santa Fe Institute, they all know that Teilhard kind of put that idea out there and made it like really salient that the world's getting more complex, but people didn't like the religious, you know, associations that he made. But so then people were against it because they felt like if they acknowledged that the world was getting more complex and that it might be going towards some final goal state, that that would just be like saying that God is right. And God saying, I mean, God is real. And, you know, there's a design, there's some sort of you know, trajectory that's been, you know, planned from the beginning and people thought that was dangerous. So then there was a backlash against anybody saying anything that life had a purpose. They wanted right. to erase that language from biology. If you said sure. life does this in any language that had a purpose, they wanted you to reword it to be like in this sort of neo-Darwinian language where you get rid of purpose and you say, oh yeah. no, like they, people were mad that people were asking little kids, like, why does the plant you know, grow towards the sun. And the kids would say, because it wants the light. And like, there's evolutionary theorists who are, you know, kind of yeah. motivated by atheism to go, no, it doesn't want to grow towards the light. That's teleological language. That's purposeful language. You have to get that out of science. It grows towards the light because the ones that were worse at growing towards the light died off. And that one just mm. happened to be better. And it just got out of sure. control. But now yeah. because of AI and emergence and just engineering, when you talk like an engineer, you kind of talk about agents, even if they're not living you kind of use this purposeful language. So you can't really get rid of this language when you're talking about the universe, because we do see these things and it's just natural, but also it seems to be the way reality is, at least this emergent phenomena it does have goals and purposes. purposes. Um, but um, yeah, so um, that backlash created this kind of whole worldview of meaninglessness. And it, yeah. it was perfect for science. Science was already going that kind of direction because it was at this war with religion a lot of times. And uh, so reductionism is just the idea that, you know, there's just a bunch of particles in the universe. It's a system of particles that are bouncing off each other. And then you can use laws of motion to understand those interactions. And then if you have those laws of motion, there's no room for human agency because everything right. would be determined by these fundamental equations that are specifying these trajectories in advance. But what my book argues is that that's not right. It's a simplified version of causality and dynamics in nature. And basically when agents emerge, there are these information processing systems uh, that exist in a universe that's not completely deterministic. There's a lot of deterministic processes, but at the very bottom level, there's 
random. There's there's an element of probability and randomness or stochasticity. And um, so there is room for freedom. And when agents emerge, they basically, um, when you're making a conscious decision, the results of your decision weren't determined by particle physics at that lower right. level. Mm -hmm. You can basically, you as a physical system, when you initiate a movement, it's not something that's violating the laws of physics. You're metabolizing energy that you ate before, but you're not in an inanimate system that can't move. You can make these decisions and you're truly making these decisions in real time. So determinism in the classical sense, that kind of Laplace kind of made applied Newton's paradigm to the whole world. And you, you have this strict determinism. That's really determinism at the level of particles, as opposed to other people talk about determinism saying that your actions are a result of your, you know, life preferences, you know, I mean, your, um, your experiences and your beliefs and your genetics, and that's a different discussion. And people conflate, conflate those two types of determinism, biological versus physical determinism. When physical determinism is a much stricter thing, that's right. saying there's no room for biological anything. Even genes in that view aren't doing anything. You could reduce genes to particles. So it got really weird because you would see evolutionary theorists being reductionists. And I would be like, if you want to be a real reductionist, then you know, like Jerry Coyne, genes don't even matter. Your whole, your whole field would be completely irrelevant. Mm. If you really knew what you were talking about, like the ideology that you're like um, advocating for, um, we could just say genes are epiphenomena too, and just mm. um, talk about particles. Sure. So yeah. the book is a pushback yeah. on postmodernism and reductionism and kind of wanting to return to this narrative of science uh, and not just science, but, but, but logic and I mean, arts in this view, we see science as something we see science as part of the evolutionary process because testing theories is just like how nature has been testing organisms. Right. And in this book, organisms are basically embodied models or embodied theories about how to survive in the world. Your genome and your brain has encoded information that makes predictions about how to survive in the world. So basically scientific theories are just kind of extensions of organisms. Um, and they're kind of, it's kind of just uh, an elaboration of this process of life, creating models that will allow it to survive mm. uh, in a world that has this tendency to break down. Otherwise, uh, aside right. from life, because that's not the full story when people say, oh, the world's going towards more disorder. What I discovered in the book is that there's this dialectical dynamic where you have order and disorder and kind of this tension. And it's because life has to always evade this tendency towards disorder that life spreads through the universe and the universe becomes more complex because you have life spreading. Um, so if you didn't have that tendency towards disorder, there would be no evolutionary pressure towards designs that are more functional that can survive better in the world. So you need the tendency towards disorder described by the second law of thermodynamics to have this whole complexification process work. Mm. So that's one big insight of the book that m almost no people talk about. I mean, this yeah. dialectical dynamic. You need the constraint. You need the constraint on the system. Yep. Yeah. Problems create progress. That's Popper's principle. It's a big, yeah. Yeah. So, so, yep. And so um, this whole idea, everybody was against this idea of teleology, which was just a word for continue inevitable progress and complexification <sighs> towards some higher yeah. goal. Right. And I understand why it's because they thought it was a supernatural idea, but now I'm saying it's not supernatural. Um, and people were saying like evolution is blind. That was wrong too. So it's, it's just more complicated. There is this mm -hmm. tendency towards progress and the whole system isn't conscious at this point. I don't believe it is, but there is an intelligence distributed throughout this network that we call the biosphere. And so you do see this tendency towards that, but it happens through mistakes that basically get corrected. If you look at the whole biosphere as a system and you look at organisms dying and some living and reproducing. If you look at natural selection as basically the biosphere doing its own scientific testing, you have this new story of life and you see that evolution actually does have this tendency towards more complexity. Why? Because as that natural selection process uh, proceeds, 
um, knowledge from the successful, like the, when I say knowledge, I'm not just talking about human knowledge, although that's part of it, but when animals that are less adapted, you know, more dysfunctional designs die out and the better designs stay, the genome, the genomes in the biosphere are also accumulating knowledge about how to survive. So when I say the evolutionary process creates knowledge, I'm talking about the evolutionary process creates knowledge in genes, in brains, in cultural memory, and, um, and then now digital memory, like the internet. Um, in cultural memory, I mean like books and stuff. So when you look at the trajectory of evolution, it's really this emergence of these information processing systems and memory systems. So you have the emergence of life, you have genes, then you have the emergence of brains, you have neural memory, then you have the emergence of societies, you have cultural memory. So you get like, you know, language and you get these ideas spreading from brain to brain through memes. Basically, we start, you know, telling stories and then you get the invention of books and, you know, written language and art. And it's all part of the same process of basically life exploring the design space because uh, it's looking for solutions to this problem of survival. And at first it's mm -hmm. doing it unconscious. And then when brains emerge, you have the emergence of consciousness. And then we start to become aware of our need to survive. And we start, it's just another layer of our motivation to, to do what nature has already programmed us to do. And what the book argues is, because I always talk about these details, but I, I don't always give the bigger picture. A lot of it is because when you say this, you know, the bigger things behind it, sometimes it turns people off. So I would save that stuff to the end or maybe not even talk about it all if it's a techni technical talk. But the main point of the book is that this process implies that there's some sort of design or logic. There's some sort, it's, it's the universe isn't an arbitrary system. Yeah, You can imagine the universe being full of marbles like that the particle story if the particle story was true and they were just little spherical objects bouncing around because when boltzmann when the second law of thermodynamics was you know and and this idea that laplace had of everything is just particles at the lowest level if you could zoom in on us you would see mm -hmm. these particles bouncing around the periodic table wasn't even invented until like 1920 so people were sure the model of particles were that they, there were these perfect spherical balls that bounce off each other elastically, just like real pool balls or, or marbles would. And if we had that, you can have a bag of marbles bouncing around for eternity, and it's not going to form the complexity of life. Mm -hmm. You need specific elements with specific properties, bonding properties like carbon and specific forces. You need all of these things to be very specific uh for all of this to work and that's known as the fine tuning problem and the fine tuning problem basically says that if you change any of these parameters like the force of gravity the force of the sh strong or weak nuclear force even by hair you wouldn't have life but you probably wouldn't have any structure in the universe you just would have just like a universe that expanded forever or contracted into you know singularity again you wouldn't even have it's not that you wouldn't have life you wouldn't have structure mm. So then the, so, so the book makes the argument though, first it makes the argument that there is this new cosmic narrative where the universe is becoming more complex and that involves, you know, the emergence of planets and stars because planets, you need planets to have life. You need stars to provide the energy for life. You need stars to fuse the simple elements together to get the elements that are in living organisms and biology. And, um, so, um, but then you get the emergence of life and then you get information processing systems in the world and and then life begins to slowly spread and because of this evolutionary process being this knowledge accumulation process um it just keeps learning and modeling the world and as it's extracting information about the world around it it just keeps expanding and that's what we're seeing now with like us leaving the planet to go into space it's something that was part of the trajectory it's not a mm. the smart idea of a billionaire or something it's what would happen on any biosphere with intelligent creatures um who have discovered science and discovered thermodynamics for example because sure. any advanced intelligence will learn that their days are numbered unless they get off the planet mm. so what i'm saying is that we have to have a new picture of the universe there is some sort of design it's almost like life is like ai it's almost like life is like the system being trained and life shouldn't be seen as separate from the universe it's part of the universe it's actually the universe 
universe's simplest components organizing themselves into a functional form that can experience itself. So life is the universe's conduit or vehicle for experiencing itself. And um, that's a very different story and it really raises all kinds of implications. And some people would reject it flat out. Like, you know, you're talking about God. You're saying that it has a design and that implies a designer. I'm done with your theory. But what I would say to that is when you look at this argument and you look at the trends, it does seem like this story is the true story right. that like we have to accept that or we have, it has to at least, mm. I think if you do a Bayesian analysis, which just is analysis of the evidence for each theory, that this theory would come out on top. And um, the funny thing is though, where people were rejecting it, if you say, oh, but we don't necessarily need a designer. There, there are theories of cosmological natural selection where there is more that you need to explain about the fine tuning problem, but you don't need to introduce a God, at least not a God from like an organized religion. I mean, and I say that in that way because you have the simulation theory, which argues that we're an intel creation of an intelligent agent. So right. what I realized writing the book is that the simulation theory and intelligent creator theory are effectively the same theory. Right. And that now that we understand that we can create simulations with agents, possibly conscious agents, we don't know. Then scientifically, since we've demonstrated that it has happened, we have to take the possibility, we have to consider a new scientific theory that we're such a creation. Mm. And there's sure. epistemological justification for that because we did it. But here's the funny thing. Before we did it, there wasn't as much justification to say that we needed to take the creator theory seriously. But once we have created simulations and we know that that's possible in this physical world, we immediately have to write down a new theory that we are such a thing. And so basically this says the atheist, you know, the theory that there's no design or fine tuning, uh, you know, th there is a, there's the appearance of a design. First of all, there's something that needs to be explained. And to do that, we have to understand why these laws and not others. So we have to think bigger than the universe. And then, so we have these different options. Is it a creator? Is it, um, a multiverse explanation where maybe there's this large ensemble of universes and we're just, you know, we're, we're just in one out of, you know, a multiverse that's mostly lifeless, which is, is again, the atheist position, um, or cosmological natural suction, which we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. or the simulation theory that were made by an agent, you know, intelligent agent. Um, and then maybe there's even another theory from that. But my point is, you can't say that there's no design and um, given what we know about the universe, you can't say this is the only universe and there's no design because that would be the hot, most improbable thing that there's one universe, it's random, and then it just happens to have the parameters that would allow for life when it could have been everything else. That's and that's why out. no one says that. That's why the multiverse theory is the rebuttal against this now because yeah. to, to destroy the God theory, you need a multiverse with all of these other options. Mm. Here's the bad thing about it. As soon as you introduce that, you get wilder ideas than a creator. You get <laughs> ideas of every universe existing. Yeah. If you're doing every possible thing, here's the tricky, here's the funny thing too. If you believe the multiverse, and we've also demonstrated that we can create new virtual worlds that might have mm -hmm. conscious agent, we can create our own universes. The multiverse theory then starts to include gods too, because it includes people who create universes just like mm -hmm. where we could, or we, we have, but we haven't created conscious agents. Mm -hmm. Let's say we could, then you, in the infinitude of all possible universes, you have universes with creators creating new universes nested in those universes. Mm -hmm. If you follow Occam's razor, the multiverse theory gives you God created the universes. It gives you every universe you could conceive of and more. So it seems to be worse on Occam's razor grounds. It introduces all of these things. It gives us the same thing that the God creator thing was. So what I argue in the book is that we have to explain the design. You can explain it playing with infinities with your multiverse theory, but I don't think that's the best explanation. I think, um, and we can get into that more later, but I just, so yeah, maybe we should just talk more about the meat you know, I know oh, we were yeah. the practical stuff. I actually talked a lot about the tech. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, I didn't yeah, talk I about touched... the technical details, but I kind yeah. of summed it all up, I guess. Yeah, you like touched and brought in. Um, I mean, I could I could talk to you for a long time about <laughs> any one of those things you brought up. Yeah. Well, before we get into the, because I do want to segue into the practical in a moment, but yeah. 
before we do, and just um, perhaps to put a button on it, you, you just mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, Bayesianism. I spoke with Carl Friston last week. I interviewed oh, him. Yeah, yeah, it's not out yet. It will, it will be out um, in the next couple of days. So for viewers watching this, that one will be out already. So uh, if you want to deep dive into, and Friston is one of the most cited people in the book. You know, you you bring you bring him in quite often. And actually, I think because I first read Romance or Reality around the holidays, and I'd heard of Friston before, but how how much he's in the book really, really put him on your radar. Put him up, yeah, to brought talk him up to, to the top yeah. of the list, and then yeah. so you um, you inspired me to, to speak with Carl Friston, you know. So thank you, and That's awesome. and it was a great conversation, very high level. Oh my god, I did not know the term um, high research load before talking to uh, Friston. That means you need all these different uh, pieces of information from different different disciplines coming together in order to understand what he's talking about because he's a neuroscientist. He's bringing neuroscience. He's bringing information theory. He's bringing in stuff from physics. But one thing that I thought was quite interesting is that I, and he wrote a blurb for your book. Also, he said it was, yeah. like a, I think, a synthesis of his favorite thing, something to that degree, yeah. which is amazing. And I think I was, I was surprised because he said that it doesn't get any more fundamental or simpler than the free energy principle which I thought was really interesting because I asked them that was sort of in response to when I brought up um, Jeremy England's uh, dissipative ad adaptation. Yeah. Which, which he said, I think to a degree, I hope this is correct, um, that that's one a subset of the free energy principle. That would be like something the free energy principle describes, but that's one of many things that the free energy principle would have a descriptor for. Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought that, that up. I'm glad yeah, you said could, that too, because that's that's what I argued in the book. I don't mm -hmm. know how much he thought about that before he read my book. I, that would be cool if that kind of, because, you know, I mean, he probably knew of Jeremy England's work, um, but as far, yeah, that's one thing I tried to do in chapter six was to show that this dissipative adaptation process that's been used to explain the origin of life is a process of Bayesian inference. That was like the one right. big novel thing that I put in the book that um, I don't always talk about. It, you know, it's pretty technical, so it's not something that has been highlighted. Mm. But that that it is a process of Bayesian inference, and we can look at all self organization processes as processes of inference. Please go on, Zach. Give me yeah. So well, and that was very useful for him to clear that up for me because. Um, you know, if you'll forgive my ignorance, I, I had thought that dissipative adaptation was something that was a sub free energy principle was something that you can look at it that way too. Yeah. So it's like, it which way, way is this going? Yeah. Right? It's and, all, he, yeah. and he actually, I think it's specifically said that he was a little bit dismissive of the thermodynamic interpretation as that being the underlying idea. Yeah. Uh, and that the free energy principle, I think, has far more applications uh, than just that. So, uh, it would be great. Do you have any thoughts about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. So a colleague also mentioned this about him, which I think I knew, but it was interesting to hear this um, kind of emphasized, but that Carl likes to put, say, you know, everything in terms of inference, but doesn't like to reduce everything to evolution, for example. Hmm. But you could say the same thing about thermodynamics, you know, that he doesn't want to reduce everything to thermodynamics. What my book tried to show is that the thermodynamic story and the evolutionary story and the inference story are the same story and that inference processes are evolution. And we'll talk about in detail what I mean by that, but that they are evolutionary processes and they are self-organization processes. So they're kind of dissipative processes. So it, it, it's mm. pointless to be like, this is a subset of that. It so, all, yeah. well, well, in a way he's right because the origin of life mechanism is one instance of the free energy principle. Mm -hmm. um, but you could, so, so if he's talking about dissipative adaptation as an origin of life theory, it's a subset of a larger inference because dissipative adaptation is an inference process. And this is one instantiation of that. It's just the origin of life. Okay. But, you could also look at all inference processes as being dissipative adaptation processes at higher levels. So you could say the whole biosphere is evolving 
through dissipative adaptation because they're just adapting. And as they adapt, they extract more energy. Mm -hmm. And if they use more energy, they're dissipating more energy. So they'll, you can look at the biosphere as a dissipative process. And before dissipative adaptation was, you know, a theory put forth by England, tons of people were saying this, Eric Chayeson, uh, Eric Smith and Harold Morowitz, Santa Fe Institute, the whole thermodynamic narrative, it, it had been told much, you know, in detail way before Jeremy England, Jeremy England just came up with this specific equation about self-organizing molecules and demonstrated that you could simulate this and kind of show that this is the case that basically if you have a lump of particles driven by a force of energy, energy and those particles have the right profiles such that they interact like you, with life, you need carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. You need those molecules because, for example, carbon makes bonds to four other uh, elements or molecules. Um, and if you don't have something that can bond to a lot of things, you can't get complex structures. Mm -hmm. So if you simulate the properties of those molecules, you can show that just a system being pushed by a flow of energy with the right properties will begin to organize. And as they organize, so that's really what we need to focus on is that you, that's the mechanism of self-organization mm. as a result of this process, because it takes physical work. I mean, stuff is happening when it's organizing itself, it has an energetic cost. So for that process to happen, to, to go against this tendency toward disorder, an organism or the system, maybe it's, you know, something that hasn't emerged, you know, life hasn't emerged yet, but it's, you're seeing like a proto organism, some sort of chemical, you know, autocatalytic network, some sort of chemical system that is self-sustaining, it has to get energy from the environment. So living systems have to extract energy from the environment to survive. And when they are extracting it to, to, to build that order, to, to organize themselves, so that costs energy, that's the thing to understand. And when you're using that energy, it's always getting dissipated. It's always getting used up and the, it's mm -hmm. really, the system's releasing heat. Yeah. And that heat is entropy. So there's, I didn't get into it here on kind of on purpose, but there's multiple definitions of entropy. There's right. entropy, which is dissipated energy. It's like heat mm -hmm. entropy. And then there's entropy with the statistical de definition, which just talks about disordered things and they're different concepts. They really shouldn't even have the same name. Right. Well, but, but, but the energy concept is kind of a subset of this disordered thing, but it just, it order form and that system release heat. So you can have, the whole universe, if life spreading, becoming more and more organized at the, at the whole global scale while more heat is being generated. So whether entropy goes up or down, it depends on your definition of entropy. Heat entropy goes up because energy is always being used and spread out and you can't use that energy again. So if entropy is defined as the energy unavailable for work, that entropy is going up. Entropy defined as organization is disorder, that entropy is going down. So you have Boltzmann entropy going down as the world gets more complex and you have energy just being used up. And then that is called entropy. That's that was the classical version of entropy. So my point is, and Jeremy England makes this point in his book, all of the evolutionary processes that happen in the biosphere are also using up energy from the sun. And, and as the biosphere becomes more complex, it uses more, it needs more energy. So it uses it. I think when you talk about dissipation too much, it gets the focus off. It makes it sound like life is trying to create entropy when it's not. It's trying right. to survive and it needs right. energy to survive. And entropy is the byproduct. So it's just the like art yeah. needs gas. It's not the goal. It's the gas byproduct. It makes yeah, yeah. exhaust. So yeah. Sure. So if you want to say the origin of life is an example of inference, that's right. And you have this dissipative adaptation mechanism, but you could also turn it around and be like, well, the inference process that Carl's describing in brains, which we'll quickly sum up in a second, um, is something that allows brains to better model the world so it can extract more energy. And then it is always extracting that energy and it's using that energy. So really you have dissipative adaptation, which in, I believe is just a, another word for self-organization, it's thermodynamic self-organization. You have that on every level and that inference is also self-organization. So. I think that the th there's things that are equivalent, learning and evolution mm -hmm. uh, and um, self-organization. Yeah. And yeah, so the thing is Bayesian inference, evolution is, you know, variation and selection. And then um, 
self-organization is this dissipative adaptation. They're all the same things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so it, it doesn't really, you don't, you don't need to like put one, yeah. uh, having priority over the other. And that was a mistake a lot of people made because when you know, Jeremy England's work and that stuff, you'd be like, Oh, it's, well, it's all thermodynamics. The, the world just wants to create entropy. It's no, the world is organizing itself and it does it through this process and this mechanism you can look at one aspect where you go, the system's learning. You can look at another aspect where you say, the system's using energy and creating entry. And you can use another ex aspect and say, it's adapting, it's evolving. Yeah. All true. You have a, yeah, you have a great, um, it's not even an equation. It's just a bunch of equivalences in the book. It's adaptation equals statistical correlation equals mutual information equals model optimization equals knowledge yeah. creation. I mean, that's, I mean, but you're, that gets to the crux of what we're talking about here is that and I actually find this not specifically with uh, with the gentleman we're talking about now, but if we may like zoom out a little bit, the word games that get played a lot. And I mean, it's just because that you need different terminal, different terms for different concepts, right? But a lot of times you start, when you think about it a little bit more deeply, you realize, oh, that's pretty much the same thing. You know, we're just, yeah. we're using language is, is fungible and we're kind of getting around it. But I do... I mean, we could talk so much more about this stuff. I have a, I have a lot of questions in this area that I'm going to mm -hmm. have to skip because I do want to focus while we have some remaining time. It looks like part three might not happen today, but what should we do with this information? If we might go from crawling, you know, we have uh, organized some information and people should get the book to get all these details for themselves um, and also read your, read your blog posts on Road to Omega, the Substack and um, Psychology Today as well. Uh, what do we do? Like, how do we make this? practical how do we bring the, this information into our day-to-day -day lives yeah so you can talk about that while i explain uh first sense theory in the context of that because it's really oh, um yeah first sense work and this so he has the bayesian brain hypothesis and the free energy principle which is just the same bayesian brain hypothesis but apply to things without brains and i realized there's so much here combined with the other work that i was you know, looking at, you know, self-organization and thermodynamics, there's so much here to inform practical living. And it's just crazy that, you mm -hmm. know, no one has kind of used that information to not many people, I won't say no one, yeah. but not many people have used that information to inform people on how to live life. And the reason is because the free energy principle, it's funny, Carl says it's simple. And I agree with him. It is the simplest thing, but if you read the papers, it's the most complicated uh, thing in the world. Yeah, I disagree. I mean, it might be the most oh, fundamental, I, I but man, explain, simple yeah, I is a tough one. Why. So it's like <laughs> both things are true at the same time. And it's like, yeah. it is insanely complicated if you want to make it, but the general principle can is, is super simple. But um, I don't think people have applied it because they don't understand it. And I didn't understand it. I wasn't even sure if it was, it was like legitimate <laughs> science that when I first looked at it, because it kept using these thermodynamic terms like free energy, right. which were defined not thermodynamically. It's like information theoretic free energy and it mm. comes from machine learning. It's based on thermodynamic free energy. Mm. But so I was like, what's this guy talking about? Like minimizing free energy in this way, but that's not free energy. So I, yeah, you just have to accept that new language will emerge because you need new words to explain new ideas. And it often comes from other fields. So there's going to be that confusion and you just have to embrace all of that and, and, and read, the, read the literature. And once you read it, you start understanding there's a lot of value. But basically, here's the story. You have this tendency towards disorder in the world. And it was great because I was already you know finished with part one, all the thermodynamics. Stuff. I had already said all this stuff. We talked about cybernetics and systems have them having to model the world. And then I found the free energy principle and it was like everything that I was like the path that I was down, it was like completed by that. So I'd already saw this picture before that, but basically, but it's cool because that's how Friston frames it. Um, and for people who don't know, he's the most cited neuroscientist in the world. He developed these statistical techniques for analyzing fMRI data that all fMRI studies use pretty much. And um, so you have this tendency towards decay. So how do you explain life? He wants to explain the organization in the world. He says, okay, specifically organisms, which are the most interesting to us, they evade this tendency towards decay uh, because they model the world and they, because they have to survive. And if they don't have a map of the world, you can't survive in the world. So the, the, the brain has to create a map. And the free energy principle basically extend that and said, even organisms without brains encode some sort of map of the environment in their dynamics. Um, in their genome, maybe in their metabolic processes and general functional dynamics at the system level. Mm -hmm. But 
So basically it's the story of how do we, you know, how does life emerge and, and survive? It emerges. Well, okay. So yeah. Um, how does life survive? Let's start there. Life survive because that's the model of the world. And if its model isn't accurate, if its map of the world isn't accurate, the thing's probably going to die. If you, you have a wrong map of the world and something comes out and kills you because you didn't ha know about that variable, you're dead. And then that design of you is gone unless you've made copies of yourself, but that's a little bit of a different design. And the people who do have good maps are successful. So those good maps keep getting encoded into the biosphere, into the network of organisms. And we keep updating our maps through natural selection. People die out. But when you have brains, you don't, things don't have to die to get better maps in the biosphere. You can learn during your life. Things without brains, they can't learn. So if they're born in a certain way, they just have those characteristics. But so we can learn. But so what is simple about it is Carl Fursen is just basically saying this. All organisms minimize what's called free energy. Don't get hung up on, for the audience, don't get hung up on the word free energy. He's saying in this context, free energy is defined as the model's prediction error. So the amount of mismatch between your model and reality is getting minimized. So forget free energy minimization. Just let's say the Carl Fristen's theory says your model error needs to be minimized or else you'll die. And that we're always trying to do that. And if we don't pay attention to the evidence, like if we don't, okay. So for example, someone who has a belief that is contradicted by tons of evidence and tons of stuff they're seeing in the real world, where it's just completely like, let's say you believe in a purple fairy God. And that's just your belief. Oh, well, that's a hard one to disprove. Let's say you, let's just do something a little more grounded. Let's say you think that gravity doesn't exist in Antarctica or something. Mm. You go to Antarctica and you, you throw a ball from like a roof and it, it, it exists. If you, if you don't update your model, if you don't go, oh yeah, gravity exists because I came here and I did that test. And if you're denying the evidence that reality is giving you, then you're not minimizing your model's prediction error. You're, mm. you're, you're choosing to stick with a model that has uncertainty or error or ignorance. Mm. And if you're living that way, you don't have an optimal map of the world. And if you don't have an optimal map of the world, you're not living optimally. So the book, you know, this is really what the second book's about and what I write about on Substack, but because I didn't have enough time with the deadline to really incorporate all of this, you know, practical living stuff. But basically what this whole story tells you is that for, or, you know, ordered things for, for sentient, any sentient system to exist in the world, to continue existing, it has to be updating its map of the world to be more accurate. And that's just called minimizing free energy. Free energy is an information theoretic term between the difference between your model and reality. So we always want to be beating our ignorance. And we don't live that way a lot. We're not always updating based on our knowledge. We sometimes ignore it. We have confirmation bias. We want to keep that out. And if we do that, we're living suboptimally. So basically there's different principles that you can follow. Be curious. That's one thing. There's a great paper by a friend of mine uh, uh, who um, wrote uh, a paper with Carl Friston on active in inference and curiosity. So you got to be curious because your model uh, is always going to be limited. None of us have infinite computational like storage space. So we can't know everything about the world. The world's super complex. There's no way to know everything. So we're all living in ignorance. The best we can do is try to make our model as accurate as possible while living life. You know, you can't spend all of your time learning everything. So you have to decide how much information you want um, to acquire. But we should always be living in that way. We shouldn't get too stuck to our beliefs. We should always be open to new ideas because our model is limited. It's going to have ignorance. And once you accept that, then for example, let's say people are, asking questions about the, the origin of the coronavirus. It became un PC to talk about a lab leak theory. That's very bad according to this uh, approach because it could possibly be the theory. Uh, and maybe it's not, but you got to look into it. And if you notice, oh, there's no chance that it was a lab leak thing, then you can go, okay, you know, based on this stuff, there's very little reason, almost no reason to think that was the case. But that wasn't true. 
when people analyzed it, what came out and then seeing in everybody had it and they didn't even like really say, oh, well, we did a terrible thing by telling everybody, do not think this, like it is wrong think to t- think this way. And then everybody started talking about, well, it could be a lab leak. Um, and there are tons of reasons why, you know, there's, I'm, you know, I won't get into the political stuff, but um, the point is um, a lot of people like flat earthers make this problem where they're not living in reality. They're not updating their model of the world. They're sure. just denying what's out there. But you also have other situations where scientists, maybe they have this reductionist ideology. They're just over certain about, oh, life is transient. It's going to come and go. There's no such thing as free will because it goes against our Newtonian understanding of the world. That's a failure of being a good Bayesian too, because they are too certain. And if you look at history, every paradigm, every model, every theory has proven to have some inaccuracies. Thanks from you know, Newton's laws, relativity, quantum mechanics hasn't been unified with relativity. So there's all these things. And in the 90s, we didn't even know. We thought we were at there. John Horgan wrote a book. It's the biggest mistake that you could do writing a book call it, but you know, it was worth it. It helped us, but it was called the end of yeah. science. And the idea was that we had, we we're almost done with understanding everything. And we thought we knew understand everything about physics this is before we knew about dark matter, or dark energy, which we only understood dark energy in the late nineties. And people thought we understood everything. And then they just try to explain away consciousness as being an illusion. So they could be like, Oh, science understands everything. Nothing, no mystery, definitely no supernatural, definitely no creator. But then Mm -hmm. shit hit the fan and we realized we barely understand anything. Like most of the universe is stuff that we don't even know what it is. Yeah, it's incredible. So um, basically, yeah, if you go on the Road to Omega uh, substack, I have these posts called the teleological stance. This post is called that. Um, I said plural at first. Yeah, Uh, actually, there are multiple posts on the teleological stance, but basically it's saying, All living systems have an intrinsic goal, and that's to survive against this tendency towards decay. So life does have a goal, and a goal gives us a a purpose. And the purpose is to see see that life continues to exist because we're part of this larger system that's becoming more complex. And what I didn't mention is that it seems to be going towards a fully integrated, self-aware state of the universe. And I'm definitely not arguing for panpsychism that everything's conscious. I'm saying that consciousness emerges because of some plan that we don't fully understand and that um, and that consciousness, because it might be a scale invariant or substrate independent thing, the, you're conscious because you have this collection of neurons that are exchanging information and somehow consciousness emerges from that. In the book, I try to explain why that's probably happening. But if consciousness can emerge from a collection of cells, who's to say that consciousness can't emerge from an interacting system of humans exchanging information? So that idea has been called the global brain. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could have, some people think there's already a consciousness at this level. I don't think there is. I think there's a collective intelligence because you don't need intelligence to have consciousness. So Mm. the sphere is intelligent. It's it's a self-regulated system. Um, But I don't think it's conscious, but I think consciousness can emerge at these higher levels. And that if life continues to spread through the universe and to do so, it has to keep f- extracting energy and it ha- and it will keep molding the universe. It'll basically keep, it will start incorporating the inanimate matter of the world into its computational substrate until the entire universe gets subsumed. Um, and, but it's not as, as if life is just taking over the universe. This was the story of the universe self-organizing into this completely functional, conscious, uh, computational state, mind, God, whatever you want to call it, doesn't really matter. It's just this unified state that will be this computational state of unimaginable power that, that everything is moving towards. Um, so it was really just a self-organizing system that has this dynamic and like part of it's being trained and it's accumulating knowledge until the whole system is an integrated system, the way an organism is the integrated system. So I think that's where it's headed. I'm about to come out with an article on Big Think analyzing new papers that have emerged from the Small and Jerry Lanier and Microsoft physicists saying that the universe is a learning machine. That was kind of influenced by another paper from 2020 by Vitaly Venturin, who says the world's a neural network. And these got articles, you know, popular mechanics articles. You can read these a couple of years ago. And, and what I'm arguing is that life is based, the universe is something like a neural network or an organism or a complex adaptive system. It's all just an information processing network that's emerging. 
And um, that life is part of this process. And that's where it's headed. You can call it a God. You know, there's lots of crazy answers about like what that is. But that's what Ray Kurzweil believes. That's what um, the neural network guy that I mentioned, he also believes that that's inevitable, um, that it's going towards that state. I talked to him a couple of days ago in person and, and he confirmed that. Yeah. So it's a radical news story saying that the universe is waking up through life. Um, but that gives us a purpose. We're part of this larger grand process and we need to do what we can to continue um, intelligence and consciousness and experience and all those things that come from sentience. We need to do what we can to ensure that spreads throughout the universe. And that involves a collective mindset change where we realize to solve our existential problems, we have to come together because we to solve these problems are so big that the whole system needs to be using all of its computational power. So any civilization that emerges anywhere will have to go through the same sort of trajectory where they come together. And we've always been coming together. We've been coming together into societies, but the thing is when we come together into a society, we come together under a belief system. And then a society emerges on this part of the world and it's a different belief system. So there's those are two super organisms that are gonna be in conflict because they basically have different genomes. They're different belief systems. So it's a genome at a higher level. It's a mm. knowledge system. So they're gonna compete until they learn that cooperation is easier and that it makes every task easier. It makes extracting sure. any, 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 it makes extracting energy easier in any task really. Right. So, it's part of a process. It's inevitable. This is a trajectory that civilization, intelligent civilizations will go through on any biosphere where you have an intelligent civilization like this, but it's leading to that larger story. And that gives us, that frames life in a way that's never been framed by science before. It says we have a cosmic purpose and we can carry out this cosmic purpose by trying to facilitate a mindset of coming together. But it's also at the individual level where you try to live optimally. You don't do what's bad for the environment because it's going to hurt you. You don't live with an ignorant or inaccurate model of the world because it's going to hurt you. And if it hurts you, it's not good for the collective. So we need to align our interests and we need to figure out how people can act in their own selfish interest, but, but at the same time, do good for humanity. So we just need to align the interests of the individual and the group um, to where um, we're getting synergy and, uh, um, without consciously adopting this mindset. And I think for people to adopt this, because without all the science behind it, it just kind of sounds like positive psychology or like self-help, sure. self-help guru stuff or, or new yeah. age stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think with the science, you know, if people go, okay, the universe does seem to be self-organizing. There is this trend. There's this, there is a meaning. We don't know what it is. We don't know if there was a designer. We don't know. And we'll talk about that next time, but we don't know if it was a cosmological natural selection process. But all we know is that reality seems, you know, our reality seems to have this trajectory and we're part of this process. And that process is good because it leads to more experiences. If life ends, that's the end of experience. That's the end of love. That's the end of feeling at least in our universe, that's the end of all that. So it's a good thing for life to exist. And the, out of this story, we get like a self-help system. We get a way to optimize your life based on, you know, just acquiring information and behaving in a way that is compatible with your future goals. Right. So is there, can I ask you, is there like an exercise or is there prescribed activities or things, methods? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so this basically says, it's basically an umbrella that goes, Hey, that meditation stuff, you're improving executive control, you know, networks in your brain. Like you're, you're improving your ability to not act impulsively. Um, so you're optimizing your behavior. Um, it's an optimization process. Um, because if you behave, let's say someone makes you mad and you punch them, or you stab them, you're, you're in jail, you're done. That's like your goals are gone. So part of living optimally in like a base optimal way is making decisions and being aware of all of the possibilities and the consequences of those decisions. So the space of counterfactuals and choosing the decision that is in line with your goals. And the idea is that your specific goals, if everyone is working towards those optimal goals, then that kind of harmonizes society overall moving in the right direction. So meditation, um, um, 
any sort of like new age practice, spiritual practice, religious practice, even like praying, for example, makes you like aware, you know, people get mad at people. Oh, Christians are saying, uh, pray for these people in the middle East. Like when they should really be doing something, your prayers aren't going to do anything. I don't think that's right because yeah, they're not doing anything, but they could not be praying. And what praying is doing, at least they're making an exercise. They're going, there's people on the other side of the world that don't have my culture. And I'm going to imagine these people suffering and I'm going to ask them for help. They're building out a theory of mind when they're doing that. They're caring about those people because of that praying action more than they would if they never did that act. If they don't do that act, they're basically like an inanimate object. It's kind of like how we, you know, we don't really treat people from other cultures. Like the more we find in common with them, the more we start to treat them like ourselves. But so what I'm saying is the act of prayer is do all, all kinds of good stuff. Like also like when you pray at night and you're like, I'm thankful for this and this, that's stuff that have emerged through evolution because it's adaptive. So for us to throw that away, and that's what atheists have been doing. They're like, Oh, we hate new age stuff. We hate religion. It's just going back to dark ages in some way, because all of those things are adaptive. Mm-hmm. So we need a new paradigm that merges science with spirituality and says, all those practices aren't bad. Believing bullshit is bad. You can die because you think homeopathy is going to cure your cancer. So that's not Bayesian, but what, but so I'm not, you know, saying everything is good about religion, but I'm saying these practices, most of them, the reason people, religion's not dying is because people find value in them. And for scientists and atheists to be like, we're just going to do whatever's the opposite of religion, which is what has happened. They're putting scientists, you know, these people at a big disadvantage. They're giving them an eye. And actually religion, organized religion is sticking around because science is having that mindset. They're not realizing the power of that. And then the regular person is like, I don't give a shit about your multiverse theory. I want a belief system that's going to help me in life and give me a community and make me wake up in the morning feeling good about life. So they're actually hurting science by being like, oh, the spiritual practices are stupid. Oh, meditation's bullshit. Um, thinking that there's something higher is bullshit. So very unproductive. And uh, I'm very passionate about this because these people who are supposed to be like our thought leaders and tell us like what's right or wrong are saying things that are causing people mental harm. I mean, really. And Sabine Hassenfelder talked about this in her book. She even wrote like a disclaimer at the beginning. Like I've written articles saying free will isn't real. And I'm worried because people have contacted me saying that they've been very disturbed by this. And people contact me too. And a lot of people say, I got out of this nihilistic trap by reading your book and the free will arguments. Um, so those people are not being good Bayesians either. They're way too certain where they're like free will is ridiculous. It's like, well, you don't understand high level causality because integrated sure. information theory and Giulio Tononi has two hour talk on the mechanisms of free will. And he says, absolutely. Free will is a mechanistic thing. It's not supernatural mm-hmm. and it's real. David Deutsch, one of the leading physicists yeah. who Sabine argues, you know, interviews in her book for a chapter on interviewed by John Horgan, the guy I mentioned earlier, he says, I'm sure we have free will. So it depends on how you define free will. And I've defined it in a certain way, but the idea is that there really is freedom. And if we're not using that freedom because we don't think we have it, we're living in a way where we're we're not going to exercise our agency. You think everything's determined and you're like, I want to help the world. And I have an idea. Like you might not put that idea out there, but if you realize I'm an agent and there it's, everything's not determined. Like I can actually make a difference on the world. You're much more likely to, to actually go through with what you're doing. Oh, sure. Yeah, I've said it for a long time. I'm not sure if I came up with this or I read it somewhere else, but I believe in free will because when I don't, I make terrible decisions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, that's so great. I, I can, yeah, I can rationalize, geez, anything. But um, I know you do have to. Run yeah, it really moment, does but... optimize your decisions, believing in it, which suggests that it's real because if it yeah, didn't do love... anything, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a great. That's a that's a huge conversation that we could have too. Yeah. But one thing I do want to, um, if you do have to run to wrap up a little bit and maybe give it, if it like sort of a teaser for next time, this idea of cosmic complexity, um, you know, this heading towards this omega point, can you give us, and feel free to speculate, feel, I know your the book is grounded in, in great science and uh, well-researched, but your intuition, let's say, you know, deep inside yourself, something maybe, something you can't prove, but why, why do you think this is all how it's laid out? Why do you think we're here? Um, like the ultimate question of like why this big story, 
this narrative. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. What's the purpose? Like, what what's going on? <laughs> yeah, so I won't be able to answer that I know. today, yeah. but I'll give the short answer. But mechanistically, I think what's going like what explains it is basically the universe is moving towards this. It's the system moving towards an attractor. Yeah. Um, and so when you ask like, and I think this theory can inform quantum mechanics because it's like, oh, there's this wave function. There's all these different probability possibilities. And that's what kind of overthrew determinism is that we understand that there's this probabilistic nature um, due to quantum mechanics. Um, but what I'm saying is actually the wave function collapse isn't random. Um, if you have an isolated quantum system, it's going to look random. But when everything's interacting, everything, all those wave functions must be collapsed. And I know some people, you know, I haven't defined these terms, but mm -hmm. yeah, just for like a high level thing, um, we'll talk about it more next time, but that, that the collapse is, if the universe is becoming more complex, that puts constraints on how the wave function collapses such that the collapses must in totality add up towards going towards this omega point. So I think it is a new, motivates a new theory of quantum mechanics I mean, there are interpretations like quantum Darwinism, which are consistent with what I'm saying, but I think the universe is moving towards an attractor and it's this, this, um, uh, functional state of like the universe being the self-aware computational conscious state with the power of a God, basically. And a God would be nothing more than a mind that has Freeman Dyson said, a God is just a mind that has, uh, achieved power beyond our comprehension. Um, so why do I think there's this design that's leading to that? Well, one explanation is cosmological natural selection is that the universe basically, our universe, there, there is a multiverse, but it's not like every possibility exists. There was this evolutionary process where in, in Lee Smolin's model of cosmological natural selection, when you have a universe form and then a black hole forms in that universe, since a, a big bang is like a singularity event that creates a universe, the idea is that when a bit a black hole forms in the universe, that's a big bang event that creates a new universe. And that's so you have these evolu this evolutionary process that's creating more and more universes. And the universes that are good at creating black holes, and black holes come from stars, and stars create the chemistry that's needed for life, then you'll get more and more universes that create more and more black holes. So more and more universes that have more and more stars. And so then this process will lead to more and more universes that are firmly for life because stars create the higher elements that are needed for life. And then so if this evolutionary process is true, you'll have this selection pressure towards getting more life-friendly universes. And then if the intelligence in that universe can engineer new universes by engineering black holes, and Alan Guth, the, the creator of uh, cosmic inflation theory, says we should be able, he doesn't necessarily believe this theory, even though people do consider it. I mean, Leonard Susskind, string theory guy said he's surprised at least Mullins, th this theory hasn't gotten as much attention, like more right. attention, yeah. but even in Alice in Go Goose model, he, he still thinks we can create a universe by creating some sort of singularity event. Even if he doesn't think that black holes are always creating these universes, which cosmic inflation kind of has a similar model where universes are created, but I'm not sure. I don't think it's the, the mechanism is through black mm -hmm. holes. There's just these yeah, that gets a little more complicated again into inflation. But um, so the whole point of that and what Swollen isn't saying is if you look at the structure of this cosmological natural selection universe, it still inevitably leads to life. And then it leads to life dominating and taking over. And that would lead to universes that become more and more complex and more and more intelligent. And ultimately that would lead to an evolutionary process towards universes that lead to a fully integrated omega point states just because it's the pinnacle of this process and it doesn't have to end there maybe our universe once it reaches this fully integrated state maybe there's some interaction with these other universes and that these omega points at this higher level will merge and form a larger superorganism. if this story of nature's particles coming together and forming these aggregates at these higher levels keeps going on maybe it's larger than this universe so maybe it continues I don't know, but the point I'm emphasizing here, which I haven't really emphasized before, is that um, it's still a teleological story. It's the one that we were trying to get rid of. Like, why is this universe designed? Oh, cosmological natural selection. But if you look at the multiverse of the cosmological natural selection world, it still starts off empty. I mean, lifeless and inevitably gets dominated by life. So it's the same teleological story. 
So even with the cosmological natural selection theory, we cannot get away from the tele teleological nature of the cosmos. Um, it, there still seems to be a life generating principle, not just where it produces life in one universe of this vastly sterile multiverse, but that life spreads and in, in the, 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 the multiverse becomes fully you know, biophilic. Mm -hmm. So whatever the answer is, there's still this life-giving principle that I see as equivalent to God. And here's the thing. If you have this process, it's going to lead to intelligent beings like us who, because the laws of physics don't disallow this, create virtual worlds that then might have their own agents. So if we're creating that, then the process leads to creators too. Mm. And so in my view, it's, not, it's kind of arbitrary to say, was our universe created or is it cosmological natural selection? I'm like, well, we don't know. It, it could be cosmological natural selection, or maybe that's not the right answer. Maybe our universe really is nested in another reality and we're a simulated world with a physical substrate, you know, just like we create computers with a physical substrate, but then there's a simulated world of virtual agents. There's no reason to, to, to say that that's not a possibility. So, but here's my point. Even if we were created by a creator, you have to explain them. And then you could explain them as a, as a result of this evolutionary process. But it's not the atheist one that leads to a mostly sterile yeah. universe. It's still a biophilic one. So my yeah. ultimate understanding was that nature has this life generating principle. It's really hard to determine. You know, we still have that why something from nothing problem, but we are making progress. It's not introducing unnecessary stuff by going outside this universe because we have the fine tuning mystery that is begging for a solution that we don't have unless we think about these other things, creator, cosmological selection, and the multiverse theory, which I don't think is a good explanation because it introduces everything just to explain away a creator when we shouldn't necessarily need to explain a creator with every possible universe exists. It's just, I don't think it's the right I don't think it's superior epistemologically, Occam's Razor, all those things we mentioned. So ultimately, I'm left with the process itself being God and that we could be created by an agent, but it wouldn't be this all-powerful fundamental thing that was there forever. It would be a product of this process, but that process seems to be eternal. So even if we have a God, a creator, I don't think if I learned about him, I don't think I'd pray to him. I, I think if we have a creator, it might be like us creating things. And then we want to ask our AI, like, is there a God? Like maybe if we do have a creator, they're looking for us to answer us. Maybe we're the AI that's going to inform them. But so even if we had a creator, I'm not necessarily sure that, I don't think that would be the end of all answers. I think it's more spiritually satisfying to be like, to just recognize there is a process that leads to life, leads to consciousness and unending consciousness, reaching higher and higher levels of experience. And to me, that's kind of a Spinoza type pantheism thing. It's, but it's beyond that because pantheism is, like, oh, this world can be inanimate and sterile, but it's God. But like, this is really giving more of a reason to say the universe is God because it's not this arbitrary random thing anymore. It's this life generating thing and so to me, that has all of the same qualities of a God. And I do think we could be somewhere far along in the process where we could be the product of an intelligent agent. And that agent could have created a moral, moral arc to this trajectory where our universe, they want to create something that improves and gets better. And that's what you're seeing. We're getting away from our original roots, kind of like, kind of compatible with like this theory of original sin, but like. We evolve from this animalistic thing. And, and as this trajectory happens, we get more moral. We develop a theory of mind. We start to understand that there are other conscious things. We start to treat them better. We start to understand we're part of the biosphere and the universe. We start to care more about the environment. So I think our evolutionary trajectory has a moral arc that is further evidence for some sort of purpose or design. And um, that part of me says, okay, there is something maybe to it. And maybe we're farther along in the process. Maybe there is a creator. Maybe they do care about what happens the way we create programs and we're interested in what happens. But I, 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 it's a personal journey for me too. I don't know. I mean, if is it, why is there evil in the world? Why isn't it more perfect? I have questions for that that I'm like trying. Mm. I think, you know, there can't be good without evil. It's all spectrum. There's no way to even define good unless you have something opposite. 
So maybe it starts off with good and evil because that's the only way it can go, but it evolves towards a more moral existence towards, you know, as you get closer to the Omega point. So it's a journey for me, but what I am convinced by is that there, you do have this trajectory. And once you start asking what that trajectory, why it's this way, you get into all the explanations that I've just said. And I think they're better than the nihilistic multiverse. We're just weak anthropic principle version. And I think that's super exciting because I really think a Bayesian analysis, anybody, I think Sean Carroll, anyone, if we have a long enough talk, if you brought me and five leading physicists who are open-minded, like Sean Carroll, Lee Smolin, maybe have some neuroscientists, Christoph Koch, Carl Friston. I think if you lay all these things on the table, we would quickly come to the consensus that at least what I'm putting forth is a good theory. Some people might say, oh, it's not as likely. They might say the, the multiverse thing in there, according to all of their stuff is a little bit more likely than this, but there's no way that you can say that this isn't a legitimate scientific theory, whether it's our universe was created by an intelligent agent or cosmological natural selection, like, and, and that's what I've been happy about. You know, the book could have come out and people could have said crackpot, like, and it just could have got killed by like, you know, reviews and stuff like that. And no one might've given a blog who is not like a Christian person, but all of the people that gave it blurbs and stuff were, were scientists or people who called themselves atheists or agnostics. I mean, there's not one Christian out of like the dozen blurbs I got, there's not one religious person. Hmm. So I know the argument is compelling, but the argument makes all these other wonderful spiritual weird implications. And since people were willing to accept the first book, I'm like, okay, now it's time to, to open up the bag of worms. If you're going to put this on the table, which really, you know, it's not this opening up the bag of worms. The fact that you had all these unsolved mysteries that this starts to solve, but it's exciting because I think with what's going on in AI and these papers coming out, arguing that the universe is a, complex adaptive system, a learning system, a neural network or stuff. Mm. It's the, it's the right time that this is about to like become, you know, there's going to be like a phase transition. There's going to be a shift in perspective that changes everyone's ideology. And that ideology will lead to greater harmony around the world. So I want to be part of that happening. Um, and it's really exciting. Um, but it just has to be done with care because, it's very easy to scare people off when you talk about like the religious stuff and religious people are scared of evolution and stuff. So it would be wonderful if people go, okay, we don't know shit really. And, um, we can, but there's stuff that we don't, that we know is not true. And there's stuff mm. that we don't know. Like we can start to come together and be like, you know, religious and, you know, scientific people can be like, there does seem to be this purpose and we do need to cooperate. We do need to come together. We do like all those things. So, um, I'm excited to see where this goes. Uh, and I'll just make a prediction that in, in 10 years, if we have a conversation again, that this paradigm will be considered, and I may not even be mentioned. I may not even be on like the wiki page for it, but, um, I do believe that, uh, in 10 years, the idea that the universe is a self-organizing system going towards this kind of Omega point computational, fully integrated state will be. Uh, if not the leading theory, it will do basically what the many worlds theory of quantum mechanics did go from complete obscurity to like start right. being like, kind of like at right. le one of the competing main interpretations. Yeah. That's so cool. And I hope it doesn't take 10 years for us to talk again, but, <laughs> but one question before you go, I have to know, how did you choose that is a hop vibration on the cover, right? Um, uh, yeah. So I don't know. Um, I've heard, I'm people, pretty sure it is. Yeah. 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 So, um, I, I, there was an interview with Eric Weinstein. I know he has the geometric unity theory and there was mm -hmm. a similar structure on his. And I wonder if it was the, well, is that from like gauge theory? I bring it up. Well, partly it has, Oh, well, I bring It's really speaking to me now because I was very fortunate about a month ago. I have a video on the hop vibration I on that, it. on that yeah. object. You got to watch it. Yeah. Well, I was so fortunate. It blew up a few weeks ago. And now it's like 800,000 views and counting, which is awesome. So nice. congrats. Yeah, it's great. Thank you. And I don't know why <laughs> it just kind of took off on its own. It's, yeah, it's I bet some big people shared it too. Yeah, pro maybe. And I think Eric Weinstein was on uh, some podcasts recently, so that okay. might have just picked it up. But people yeah. are really drawn to this this geometric object for some reason. A lot of a lot of the comments. I've been people seeing this while, say, 
meditating or an altered state of consciousness. Wow. Very cool. You know, I mean, a lot of people, and I mean, that's probably not so uncommon for an, an, a geometric object that's kind of interesting and has, you know, yeah. can undulate and stuff like that. But um, but I wanted to know if there was any like deeper significance behind yeah, that so being I'll, on the cover because it's not mentioned in the story. book. Yeah, I'll quickly tell you yeah. the story, and I think um, I don't think she would mind me saying this. So the artist is named uh, Francesca Lorenzini, and um, on on Instagram she's uh, Francesca Acacia. But um, she had all this art that was kind of she has a background in psychology and philosophy, so mm -hmm. it's very scientific like, yeah. um and database and so was that i'll link to, I'll link to yeah, her yeah, stuff that'd too be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah 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 that'd be mm -hmm. awesome um so um i was looking through all that art to like find uh the right thing because i knew that had a certain stick i have a few artist friends who i i had in mind and the original one uh fell through they just didn't have time and it, it was going to be very similar to annika harris's conscious cover where it's like all the sprawling organic like and kind of cosmic mm -hmm. stuff and that's what we were going to go with but since she kind of stole the i mean she didn't know about it but i mean i got scooped on that idea mm -hmm. so i was looking for this picture and i saw that and i asked her where she got it from and she was like i did acid it's and like I, I i saw that yeah i bring yeah. that up because you said people see that so she yeah. had a psychedelic experience where she saw something like this but then she went out looking for it and she found that and it was like a matlab data visualization that someone had made yeah but she tweaked it she That's tweaked right. it and then we put the person in it and we put it on the background it's beautiful but it's i did i didn't know what the structure was called even and I, yeah. I i had heard about those structures and i knew it was something like that but um i don't know if yeah. it's exactly the same thing oh it is um, i'm i'm, I'm 99 sure it, it is it shows it's... loops and levels it shows like the theme of the book sort of like this recursive yeah. nature and that's kind of my, I, I think it's an important it's, structure. It's, it's, it's weird, technically right? <laughs> a, it's a mapping from a 4D a hypersphere onto a traditional, what we would call traditional sphere. So it's the fiber bundled and you can visualize it in many different ways. You can just cut away most of the fibers and those are sort of, that's the visualization that she has there. And there are perhaps, I don't quite know. I can't quite tell how important it is in physics. Apparently there mm -hmm. are seven, seven or eight different applications of it in fundamental physics situations. I've been yeah. trying to reach out to the physicist who wrote a paper about it like 20 years ago, uh, but I can't get in touch with him. So maybe I'll talk to uh, Eric Weinstein about it uh, because he thinks it's the most important object in the universe. But I can't tell, honestly, and I want to tell I can't tell either. I, Eric to Weinstein, audience is that so, I'm just so... not sure how important it is. It could be very important. It could be, you know. I don't, I don't know enough. But... I don't know enough. Eric Weinstein's interesting because he's a person where I feel like I know a lot about science, but I do not know enough about math that you to understand whether he's got some substantial ideas or not. So that's something I want to deep dive into um, because anytime anyone's like, I, I figured it out, I think it's worth looking into. But like, I, I have no idea if it's as important as he says too. It's, interesting i definitely want to learn more about it yeah. but i do i do think it is i mean some in some way like that's why i used it i think it captures everything and i think we're at like an early stage in mathematics where we haven't started to understand i've been talking to people about this like recursive sets and stuff there's like these structures that I, I do think he's on to something and 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 we need to um to, to learn more about it but yeah i i think if anything it kind of supports this idea that reality is structured through loops and levels which we didn't really talk about but there's there's hierarchical organization and there's all these uh feedback loops and so i think um it probably is like some kind of key to unlocking the secrets of reality yes possibly and it's funny because we didn't talk about it and i think you do mention it in the book but uh douglas hofstadter's girl escher bach yep. which is all about loops and levels and i read that like two summers ago for the first time mm -hmm. and it blew my mind yeah me too. but i will say since that book my favorite book is yours so <laughs> the romance That's, of reality yeah. please go out and read it people it's fantastic so thanks so much carlos this has been Thank a lot you, of Bobby. fun yes yeah, wonderful. Right. i can't wait for round two i have a bunch of questions i'll save for next time and i just really appreciate your time thank you bobby let's do it all right yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of fun